Hey everybody, it's Jason Blaha here, and today I want to chat with you guys a little bit about my favorite quad exercises, what I feel bring the most to the table for my quads, and obviously there's other things I do that contribute. Obviously things like my deficit speed pulls and stuff contribute. But by and large, I feel like these days most of my quad growth is coming from doing deep speed boxes, right? Speed squats on a box three inches below parallel along with my hip belt squats and the reason I feel that these work best it comes down to the amount of quad activation that we get relative to the amount of fatigue that we create All right there's fatigue issues now obviously the hip belt squat it makes a lot of sense anyone who looks at it who understands things like axial loading and other stuff looks at that and goes aha I guess that's in a way like a leg press well no because a leg press puts stress on your back right have people injured their back on the leg press you bet they have you bet they have and it's actually very hard sometimes to get a deep range of motion on the leg press without putting stress on your back okay and that actually can interfere with your recovery and for most of us who, who are heavy lifters who we do so much deadlifting and other stuff our back gets a ton of stress on it right overhead pressing shrugs squats deadlifts all these things we put a ton of compressive stress on our back it's axial loading that can be an issue for recovery okay there's a reason we don't do 30 sets of deadlifts a week Okay, there's a reason for that they're hard to recover from and it has to do with the stress that we place on our back and both compressive stress and shear stress on our back can be problematic well the hip belt squat just completely eliminates that all the weight is on your hips, right? All the weight is on your hips. Furthermore, a pretty light weight on that can be extremely taxing. Like in this video, the clips you guys see, I'm doing sets of 20 with only 200 pounds there. I squat 550. Okay, I squat 550. Now, I'm sure some of you out there listening might squat just as much, if not more. I have friends who do. I know people who squat more than me. Statistically speaking, though, that probably isn't you. Let's, let's be realistic here. Less than 1% of people listening are going to squat that much. 200 pounds completely destroys my quad on that exercise for a set of 20. So if you're someone who's squatting 350, 400, think how little weight you're going to need to actually get a good impact from that. If you get the right belt, and you need a hip squat belt and if you go all the way to parallel you go deep okay and that's the main thing it is in terms of stimulus to fatigue one of the best things you could do for your quads right and it carries over the movement pattern is perfect to the squat it works all the muscles of the lower body identical to a squat it's the same movement pattern and because you usually have the weight between your legs you're forced to do it wide wider stance squatting works more muscles than narrow stance squatting before someone jumps in and says, oh, but less quad, that's actually been debunked by researchers. Scientists have actually tested that. That's been completely debunked, both biomechanically and with EMG studies. Like, that doesn't actually make any sense. That's just nonsense that people made up, not based on, on the human body. It doesn't work that way. That wide stance brings other muscles into play, too. Okay, so it is a phenomenal phenomenal quad developer and it's mainly because you can do so much work on it you know i mean for me i do about six sets a week on it right now and my quads are just destroyed my legs are usually shaking after three sets in one workout because i have two lower body days every week like i'm usually just shaking but the beauty of it is it's my quads and then my quads sometimes i need to massage them a little bit but then i can go do other training like it doesn't fatigue the rest of me I can go do upper back work, I can do reverse hypers, I can do hamstring work afterwards just fine. My quads don't want to be touched. So it's something that, that creates an enormous amount of training effect and makes you your legs shake and everything. It's a, a tremendous pump in your quads, a tremendous burn, but it doesn't beat your recovery itself up. Like five minutes later you're ready to go do other lifts and you can do them heavy and strong. As long as they're not using the quad as a primary mover. So it doesn't have a real systemic impact that's negative. 
All right, you pair that together with speed boxes. Okay, we there's a lot of different ways to go about speed squats. There's a lot of different bars. There's a lot of different band chain combinations. We could do box heights. Generally speaking, how do we use the most quad? The deeper we squat, right? Half squats don't even use the entire quad. Well, squats in general don't use the entire quad. But I'm not going to get into that discussion. That's a totally different discussion. What squatting can do is fully develop the lower half of the quad, okay? Which is what we need for squatting. And anyone who actually is even chasing the whole aesthetic leg thing, that's what you want, right? Isn't that really what you want? You don't want carrot thighs. Well, squats don't actually build carrot thighs. It's, it's leg extensions that do that. But that's another topic completely. That's another topic completely. Deep squats work that area down by the knee completely. All right, those two heads down by the knee, those teardrops. If you go to parallel or lower on a squat, those get fully worked. And the deeper you go, the more activation they get. And with half squats, they get the least activation. If you're going onto a deep box, what do we have happening? Well, we get a, a nice deep D angle. Look, in my case, I'm three inches below parallel. But notice that we sit back on the box squat. There's no knee shear. Okay, my knee doesn't come anywhere near my toe. We can argue about the safety of the knee going past the toe. And I would say under most cases, it's actually not that big of a deal if you're at a deep depth. But from a recovery end, it does matter. All right, if you want your knees and connective tissue around the knee to recover, you probably don't want to do a lot of that. Well, the box squat lets you sit back and avoid that. Watch how, watch what happens. Watch it. Okay. Box squats are very easy to recover from compared to similar levels of intensity on a normal back squat. Particularly things like the knees. And if we go deeper, what happens? If we go deeper, we're forced to use an even slightly lighter weight to get the same training effect. Which means what? Less stress on the back? I mean, it's still there, but it's not the same. What happens when we do speed work? Okay, in those sets, I was only using 50% of my max with that bar on the box, plus a ton of band tension. So I've got a lot at lockout that I'm hitting against. But when we look at the stimulus to fatigue ratios of speed work, like in, in that day, I did 12 doubles. What are we getting for effective reps on speed work? If you look at the effective rep theory, and then you look at how muscle fiber recruitment works with compensatory acceleration, all of those sets were two effective reps, right? Because we had maximum force generation, therefore we hit upper threshold fibers. I got 24 effective reps. You would have to do five sets to failure to achieve that. If you were using normal tempo work, five sets to failure to achieve that, all right? When's the last time you did five sets of back squat to failure and felt like you could recover from it? Pretty rare, unless you're a novice. If you're a novice, if we can get away with that, we run a lot of five by fives and things, but they're not always, they're not really to failure, are they? There's always a rep or two in the tank most of the time. Okay, with this, uh, they're all effective reps. We're getting similar motor pattern and muscle fiber recruitment to getting within one rep of failure on every rep. 24 of them. We do them with very, very short breaks too, so they're not that time intensive. All right, what's the, the end result? The end result is that we end up with a tremendous amount of overall growth, but the quads themselves are getting hammered. Okay, the quads themselves are getting hammered. And I get people who, who see me, and I mean, no one wants to know what I do for my biceps, obviously, because I, I'm not known for my arm development. Like I'm, I'm known for not having the best arm development. No one asked me how to get ripped because I'm not known for being ultra lean either. And I'm known for being strong. And my quads are one of the things that people notice. How do I build my quads? Well, I'm showing you guys how I build my quads. This combination is phenomenal. This combination is absolutely phenomenal for quad development. If you want big, thick quads, deep speed squats combined with hip belt squats, all right, you can do enormous amounts of training stimulus and still recover from it. And that's the name of the game. 
All right, guys, well, that's really all I have to say on that today. I hope it's been informative, and I will talk to you guys next time.